The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. era in American history has been sagely interpreted by its humorists. In the frantic era we've just passed through, it was Will Rogers. As endearing to his generation as Oliver Wendell Holmes, Bill Nye, and Mark Twain were to theirs, Will Rogers, in the words of a contemporary, was the spokesman for his countrymen, Vox Populi in person. His kindly humor enabled him to walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. The Cavalcade of America brings you his story in an original radio play written by and starring his friend, the popular columnist Cal Tinney. Our Cavalcade Orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Cal Tinney in the story of Will Rogers on the Cavalcade of America. <laughs> Indian Territory, the year 1899. On the station platform in the little town of Claremore, Oklahoma, a lanky youth in boots and jeans is perched on the baggage truck, passing the time of day with the station agent. Yes, sir. See where they're making plans to get the territory admitted as a state. If you ask me, they don't know when they're well off. Well, I'll come, Bill. It's nice and peaceful here now. Just a uh, kind of a blank space on the map. Give it a name and a couple of senators... And Pretty soon there'll be so many people on the roads that we won't be able to drive the cattle to rain. <laughs> I guess there's something in there. Sure. Take Texas. Used to be Texas is just cow country. I was down there last June. Puncher pointed out a feller to me, town's first citizen. A self-made man, what's more. When that feller come to Texas, he didn't have a penny. Now... He owes $100,000. <laughs> well, Bill, there's number eight. She's on time. Yeah. We're going to have to climb down so I can move this truck up. You won't need it. Nobody coming in but my old man. I'll just lug his stuff over to the buckboard myself. Oh, there's Papa up ahead there. Hey, Papa. Well, well, son. Well, you're looking fine. Papa, gosh, it's good to see you. Here, let me help you them suitcases. Yeah, I can make it all right. Buggy's right over here. Well, son, how's things going? How's your courting coming along? Papa, I come to the conclusion women are like elephants. They're nice to look at, but I'd hate to own one. <laughs> well, you change your mind about that. Uh, danged if I know where you get your notion. Not from me, anyway. Maybe not. Get up there! Well, you know, son, I was worried a little when the market fell the way it did. When I I knew you'd have sense to sell our steers quick the minute prices started down. How much you clear, actually? Well, you see, it was this way, Pop. Gosh, mighty. Look at that herd over there. Whatever that is must be crazy, waiting for prices to go up. Why, in Chicago, they say they're going even lower. As a matter of fact, Pop. Absolutely. I'm sure of it. Well, I knew my boy would look after things. I'm proud of you, son. Thanks, Papa. Yes, sir. As I was saying to... to, to hey, wait a minute, Bill. Rain up there. Whoa, whoa. Uh, what's the trouble, Pop? Why, Bill, that's our brand. Whole herd's our brand. Well, what does this mean? Reckon it means it's our herd. What? Out of all that... What have you been doing all this time? Well, uh, I entered the roping contest. And I won a medal. And $50. $50. I stand to lose my shirt so you can win $50. Well, I give up. What do you want to do, Willie? I don't know. I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd sell you my herd and go to Argentina. Stop off and see London on the way. Uh, well, son, I don't know how to advise you anymore. 
If you're going to be a fool, I guess there's no help for it. So go ahead and get it out of your system. I only ask you for one thing. If you got to be a fool, be a money-making fool. Johannesburg, South Africa. The year 1902. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, step right up close. A little closer, please. That's right. Won't cost you a thing. Uh, you've just seen me do this here now, stupendous rope trick. And I'm making a bona fide and sensational offer of 100 American dollars. 100 good old USA simoleons to any man, woman, or child in the audience today who can duplicate this trick. Now, if he thinks he can, just let him step right up here and try it. Just a minute there, brother. Uh, uh, what is it, partner? If you don't mind, I, I think I'd like to try my hand at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's your chance to show off what you can do, partner. Step right this way. Don't be afraid of the crowd. They won't bite you. <laughs> That's it, right down here. Get out of the way, sonny. Let that gent through. All right, partner. Here's your rope. Thanks, brother. He must think he's good. <laughs> All right now, pal. Let's see you do it. Easy does it, you know. Right slick rope you got here. Yeah. yeah. He sure is. He's pretty good. He's better than the other fella. That's a bigger yeah. trouble. You're all right. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Ah, that's all part of the show. He's a regular cowboy. No, no, no. I'm sorry, mister. That's just where you're wrong. I never laid eyes on him this here minute. And to prove it, I'm going to take him inside and give him that $100. Uh, just step in the tent here, stranger. Yes, sir, I sure will. Yeah, watch your head there, watch your head. That's it. Huh? Yeah, great little town, Johannesburg, ain't it? Say, you sure are handy with the rope, kid. Well, what's your name? Uh, will Rogers. Now, about that $100... Say, uh, can you handle a horse as well as you can a rope? Sure. Rode the range ever since his knee high to a jackrabbit. Yeah, that's... Well, how would you like to join my outfit here as rider and roper? We're going on to Australia. What you say? Well, what about that hundred dollars? I'm plumb broke. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm kind of hard up myself, friend. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put you in my show instead. Bill you as the Cherokee Kid. How's that sound? What? Well, I reckon so. Sure. <laughs> a minute. Huh? By golly, it is Bill Rogers. Zach! Zach Mulhall! Why, you old knew you! When would you get back to Claremore, Bill? Oh, been back about a week. Place has changed. And see, the town's got a new Nickelodeon now. Yeah, getting too settled, if you ask me. Heard you was with some Wild West outfit in the Orient, Bill. Yeah. And you know what, Zach? That they billed me is the Cherokee Kid. <laughs> get out. <laughs> you should have seen us in Sydney. What are you doing now, Zach? Well, I'm getting together a little old riding and roping outfit for the pike at St. Louis Exposition. I'd like to have you join up with us, Bill. Thanks, Zach. I'll just, uh, I'll think it over. No, no, I can't seem to make up my mind to nothing. Tell your fortune for a dime, Jen. Step right this way and we'll give you ten dollars a dime. Fortune teller. Ten cents. Come on, maybe good for laugh. Ah, the two gentlemen wish to like it to read the future. Come on, come on. You're what do you say, Bill? Right well, this way. Why One not? <laughs> okay, dime. Zuliki, here's your dime. One dime. Just step inside. I read the shy one first, yes. The hand, please. Ah, the youth has a portentous future. Zuleika has much to tell him. Now listen, I ain't yes. raising the ante none. <laughs> Just a dime's worth, please. Ah, you have the hand of genius. It is a strange and wonderful hand. Yes, I see here. Now, wait a minute. That bump's where a mule bit me. Well, that is no matter. Ah, uh, you will become very famous. Maybe, uh, maybe on the stage. What's he going to play, Hamlet? It is not a joke. <laughs> yes, yes, he will be famous. People will throng to him. He will be paid, uh, he will be paid millions. What for? I see, I see a great talker. I see the great orator. I don't know. I don't know. It is in the hand. 
Talking to the multitude. Oh, that's enough. Yeah. Never heard such foolishness in my life. Anybody would pay to listen to a cow hand like me shoot off his mouth, something's the matter with him. Nineteen twelve, a down at the hill opera house in a midwestern tank town. I don't understand it, George. That's the best roping I ever done. Last on a horse and rider just like that. Sure it was. An audience out there, they're just sitting on their hands. Well, Bill, I'll tell you what's wrong. The act needs a little spiel, huh? You know the old build-up. I notice when you're roping, you uh, mumble to yourself. Well, why don't you try that? Only loud enough so the audience can hear it. I ain't a talking act. Well, go ahead. Try it. Just one. Well, maybe. Might as well try anything once. Oh, there's my cue now. Good luck, Bill. Stop that noise now, folks. That goes for you too, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to call you show enough attention to this next little stunt I'm going to worry the pony with. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to throw about two of these ropes at once. Catching the pony with one and the rider with the other. Don't have any idea to get it, but here goes. <laughs> that, that wasn't supposed to be funny. Uh, just, just trying to tell you what I'm going to do. Ain't nothing funny about that. Unless it's because folks nowadays don't hear the truth very often. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll, I'll do my best for you. Okay, Professor. You see, George, I went and made a fool of myself just taking your advice. But, Bill, the audience liked you. Didn't you hear them? I heard them laugh at me. That's what you mean. Sure, they laughed at you. It's the way you talk. Brother, I can talk English as good as they can. And I don't aim to be no laughing stock just because I ain't so good talking on a stage. I'll never open my trap out there again, George. You understand? All right, Bill, all right. But you're making a big mistake. These people liked you. Whether you like it or not, kid, that's your ticket. <laughs> A casual word from a theatrical manager and Will Rogers discovered his destiny. From that moment on, he became the humorous interpreter of American common sense. It was this quality that so endeared him to audiences that by 1916, he was performing in the most envied place in the entertainment world, the Ziegfeld Follies. Broadway, the Midnight Follies, the war year 1917. You know, folks, this here's a new rope I got with me. Ain't quite broke in yet. Anyway, this is just sort of a little interlude Keep in your seats to help Mr. Ziegfeld out while the girls are changing their outfits for you. You know, we had quite a lot of trouble keeping our girls together on tour. Every town we went to, some of them would marry millionaires. But in a few weeks, they'd catch up with the show again. <laughs> oh, now we'll take this here rope. Bigger than the other one, ain't it? <laughs> you know, this is the one that Mr. Ziegfeld borrows from me. It, it, so he can lasso the girls every time they see a Pierce arrow somewhere. <laughs> you know, you know what? If they'd send a lot of these here Follies Pippins overseas in the same sort of costumes they wear here, you know, they'd not only get the soldier boys out of the trenches by Christmas, why, doggone, they'd have Kaiser Bill and Clemenceau shooting craps to see which one would head the line to the stage door. <laughs> oh, here the girls come. There I go. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Huh? Oh, hi, your sister. Say, how's the baby? Oh, he's well, Mr. Rogers. Good. He cut his first tooth yesterday. Can you beat that? Say, look it. Take this, sis. Oh, no, no. Oh, go on. Take it oh, now. No. Buy him a toothbrush with it. <laughs> okay, I will. And thanks a lot, Mr. Rogers. So long. I'll fix Mr. Rogers. Oh, say, just a minute, sister. Hold on there now. Huh? I see that fella again. Out there in the second row. Eight nights straight now, ain't it? Yeah. Cute, isn't he? You kind of like getting into a limousine every night after the show, don't you? Sure beats the subway. And he's a smart-looking young chap. What's he do for a living? Well, he doesn't have to work. There's millions in his family. Well, let me tell you something, sister. When it comes to a question of choosing the fella that can earn his meal ticket, 
and the guy that inherits his, you're safer choosing the first one. Because if the other fellow loses his, where are you? Well, out in the cold, I guess. You darn tootin' you are. I've been around, sister. You watch your step. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Rogers. I'll remember what you said. The Twenties, era of Whoopi and the Speakeasy, of the Flapper, the Hip Flask, and the Coonskin Coat, of Babbitt Baiting and the Boyish Bob, the Charleston and the Black Bottom, and the Blues. Well, all I know is just what I read in the papers. Looks to me like America's like an insane asylum. There ain't a soul in it that'll admit that they're crazy. The Scopes Monkey Trial, Teapot Dome and Muscle Shoals, gangsters, rum runners, and racketeers, the Florida Boom, Lady Evangelists and Hindu Messiahs, and the followers of Dr. Kue. You know, there's, there's still a lot of monkey in the human race. Throw anything you want into our cage, and we'll give it serious consideration. Rudolph Valentino, King Tut, and Queen Marie. Several thousand women were said to have fainted at the sight of the Prince of Wales. But Will Rogers weathered the storm, and it was to Will Rogers that the heir to England's throne went for understanding of the American public. In an anteroom of a Long Island mansion, Will was received by the Prince's equerry. You're familiar with the etiquette of royal audiences, Mr. Rogers. Oh, sure, sure. I'm heaven's gift to the people that didn't get to see Queen Marie. Yes, quite. Uh, you understand, of course, that the Prince of Wales is here incognito as Baron Renfrew, but must be addressed as Your Royal Highness. Well, I get it. Uh, very well. If you'll just come this way, Mr. Rogers. Thanks, thanks. Your Royal Highness, Mr. Will Rogers. Howdy, Prince. House trick. <laughs> okay, Mr. Rogers. You know, okay. I, I've seen Englishmen before, but I knew you'd be different, Prince. You're the first Englishman that didn't come over here to lecture. <laughs> I leave that to you, Mr. Rogers. I don't speak the language well enough. And you're doing all right, Prince. Say, you know, th th this ain't a bad joint for a rented house. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Uh, tell me, Mr. Rogers... How do you think I should go about being an ambassador of goodwill in America? I mean, do you think being royalty is a disadvantage? Well, we figure it this way, Prince. You've made yourself mighty popular in spite of your birth. Americans admire any man who can rise above his surroundings. <laughs> Another thing, Mr. Rogers. You know the stories that are going the rounds about my taking spills from horses <laughs> at steeplechases and polo matches? Sure, that's the best joke material since the Model T. <laughs> of course, I, I don't care about myself, Mr. Rogers, but there is a more serious side to my American visit. Maybe you could help me out. I've heard in England you speak for America with few but very effective words. Prince, don't think I'll help you that way. And I'll tell you why. I used to feel like you when people laughed at me. But I found taking it all in fun uh, made people like me. Remember this, Prince. As long as your countrymen and mine can, can laugh at each other's shortcomings, just so long and no longer, we'll be good friends. That sounds like good advice from a typical American. <laughs> I ain't just a typical American, Prince. I'm an original American, too. <laughs> Part Indian. My ancestors, oh, they didn't come over on the Mayflower, but they met the boat. The familiar sunburnt face and the quizzical gray eyes, the careless forelock and the good-natured smile. Will Rogers, a national figure, his syndicated news column read daily by 40 million readers, the spokesman of his generation. In Europe, it was accepted as fact that what Will Rogers said was what the American people thought. And it was in 1926 that President Calvin Coolidge summoned him to the White House. Mr. President, may I present Mr. Will Rogers? Oh, beg pardon, I, I didn't catch the name. <laughs> uh, Coolidge, Vermont. Now, that wasn't fair, was it? I, I fussed you, and folks always laugh when they're fussed. Well, on the contrary, I was warned you'd try something like that. I laughed to oblige you. You call that a laugh? <laughs> All right, I give up. Uh, sit down, Mr. Rogers. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Mr. Rogers, you've rendered your country a great service as a sort of ambassador at large. As a matter of fact, I called you here because I have been somewhat worried of late. Oh, go on. 
I never knew any Vermonter to do much worrying on $75,000 a year. <laughs> That's another matter. As president, I must tell you our relations with Mexico are absolutely stalemated. You are the one man who could get President Calles to relax and talk freely with us. You mean uh, just, just kid along like, like you and me have been kidding? That's the idea. Well, all right, but on one condition. And what is that, Mr. Rogers? That I can sleep late in the morning. I don't hanker to be shot at sunrise. <laughs> The twenties were tumbling to a chaotic close. Prosperity, bull markets, America riding the crest. The talkies, cellophane and streamlining. And then 1929, Black Thursday, and the bubble burst. Headlines, breadlines, bonus marchers, and Will Rogers continuing to voice the common sense of the American people. Seems funny to hear people carrying on about this country being broke. How can it be broke? This will be the first time a nation ever went to the poorhouse in an automobile. <laughs> Just one thing worries me right now, and that's all this talk about me running for president. Now, as long as it was a joke, it's okay. But let me make this clear. Now, once and for all, this country's got enough problems to face without putting a, a professional comedian in the White House. In Seattle on the morning of August 23rd, 1934, Will Rogers and Wiley Post took off on what was to have been a pioneering round-the-world flight to blaze a trail for North Polar Aviation. All the world knows the outcome of that flight. America remembers the picture of the man in a rumpled sack suit who emerged from that plane at Fairbanks, Alaska, the last picture ever taken of Will Rogers. Well, pal, I guess we're all set. Motor okay? Yep. Well, so long, friend. Say, wish you'd see that this box fur piece gets mailed home. It's a dandy pelt, ain't it? Sure is, yeah. Glad to mail it, Bill. But I think you and Wiley had ought to wait over. Just got a report of fog all along your route up to Point Barrow. Well, if we meet bad weather, we'll just set her down. Open up a can of chili. We'll throw a party till it clears, won't we, Wiley? Huh? Can't hear you, Bill. Okay. Well, here we go. Off for somewhere. Goodbye, pal. Had a fine time here. See you next time around this way. Bye, Bill. Bye, Wiley. Good luck. Nice, fella. That, that chap ain't. Guess you like pretty near everyone, Bill. Well, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I never met a man I didn't like. Today, Will Rogers has two shrines, one of stone and bronze standing on a windswept hill near his hometown of Claremore, Oklahoma, the other in the hearts of his fellow men, who have come to remember him for that gentle philosophy and homespun wit that characterized him as the spokesman of a fabulous era in American life. Will Rogers, whose memory belongs to the great tradition that is the cavalcade of America. To Cal Tinney and the Cavalcade players, our thanks for their performance of the story of Will Rogers. And now the DuPont Company brings you its story from the wonder world of chemistry. The New Year. The first day of the fifth decade of the 20th century of our Lord. Behind us, fading like fireworks in the dark sky, 
we put the dreams and deeds of the past year. But we do know that both the dreams and the deeds of men of good heart live after them. And looking back, we can see that our great men always have shared much the same dream. The dignity of the human spirit flowering in liberty. It was that dream, a vision of free men in a new world, which guided the young fathers of this republic as they wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So let us not forget ourselves. Let us not forget that here in America, we have inherited the great dream and its fruits. Our freedom flies like a flag on the wind, and we know it is good. The great dead bear testimony. Washington, Franklin, Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Lincoln, Lee. We call the roll of the cavalcade of America. And not only of the statesmen and soldiers, but of the many great builders in the fields of science and discovery. Robert Fulton and John Fitch. Steamships. Charles Goodyear. Rubber vulcanization. Samuel F.B. Morse. The telegraph. Eli Whitney. The cotton gin. Luther Burbank. Horticulture. Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone, Thomas Edison, the electric light, Walter Reed, preventive medicine, the Wright brothers, flight. These are Americans. This is America. These are the men freedom has produced, and these the good things which came to be under freedom's banner. Now, in this new year, we march forward, for history is a one-way street. In a cavalcade as vast as that of America, the part any single company plays is a humble one. Yet the very same spirit of free enterprise, so characteristic of America's great discoverers, likewise makes possible the manifold achievement of DuPont chemists. Such better things as lucite plastic, cellophane cellulose film, Duco and Dulux finishes, neoprene chemical rubber, DuPont rayon, nylon, and countless other triumphs of research laboratories which enrich our daily lives and help to ensure our national security. It is to the continued creation of these good things and continued service to the best welfare of their country that the 76,000 men and women of the DuPont Company rededicate themselves this new year. In the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. Next week, the Cavalcade of America presents Mightier Than the Sword, an original radio play on the life of Thomas Nast, one of the foremost cartoonists in American journalism. And now the star of that broadcast, William Johnstone of the Cavalcade Players. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know the symbols of our political parties, but very few of us realize that the elephant and the donkey were symbols created by a 19th century cartoonist named Thomas Nast. He lived during a time when civic corruption was threatening to ruin American politics, and he fought it with the best weapon at his command, the cartoon. Admiring anyone of such courage, as we all do, I am honored to portray the role of Thomas Nast on our broadcast next week. Thank you. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes for the new year from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.